To me, the answer to the question of what does it mean to be Scioto Ridge is the answer to a sort of a lifelong question. And that is, what does it mean to be a real faith community? And, and I think in Scioto Ridge, we've found that place, which is a place that is entirely affirming of all people, while at the same time being loving and intellectually curious and honest about the answers to all sorts of questions and a place that's open to asking all sorts of questions and having diversity in answers and all other areas also. Well, we always feel welcome here and that's, that's a great feeling for us. I am spreading that love of Christ into the world in a tangible and intangible way. Um, so that's that's what Scioto Ridge means to me. Scioto Ridge means to me that in, like um, learning about Jesus and his um, adventures. Being Scioto Ridge uh, means to me being a church that uh, it doesn't matter what your story is, it doesn't matter what your past is, it doesn't matter what questions you have, that you are welcome here, you're safe here, uh, that we love where you're at and we'll continue to grow together uh, as all of us are on this journey of faith. Will you show your love to Sean for putting those videos together? Today's uh, message of the value we're talking about is being perfectly imperfect, and I have perfectly imperfectly screwed up uh, the video every week uh, I get up to preach, so it's just, it's, it's perfect. Uh, so we are in, uh, coming to an end in this sermon series, uh, being Cider Ridge, following the way of love or living the way of love. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a time for us as a congregation to name some of our values, some of the non-negotiables about who we believe we are and who we're being challenged to become even more. Uh, so we've talked about the values of being a Christ-centered church, being a missionally oriented church. Uh, we've celebrated that we are an intergenerational generational church. We talked about the power of being a relational church and, and doing life together. Uh, last Sunday, we talked about the beauty and complexity of being an inclusive church in all of its uh, full expressions. And today, we end by this admission that even as we've named all these beautiful things about who we are uh, and these challenges of who we are becoming, we are a perfectly in perfect congregation, using that phrase that Pastor Todd loves to use, uh, the beauty of being perfectly imperfect. It reminded me as I've been kind of preparing for today's message of the challenge that uh, as somebody who doesn't like imperfection, uh, I tend to be a little bit of a type A person. Uh, I'm a little bit of a control freak, and so uh, imperfection is not what I enjoy. And to give you an example of this, I, I do all the cooking in our house. I, I love to cook. Uh, I love the creativity of cooking. Uh, I love to, to plan meals and think about uh, fun meals to do. And anytime we come to like a holiday or, or um, a significant moment, in, in history or whatever it might be, uh, I'll, I'll plan a whole meal around that theme, whether it's Halloween or, you know, St. Patrick's Day. We always do big Irish food. Uh, and so I remember, you know, a few years ago when uh, 2016, the Summer Olympics, w when it was in Rio. And so I decided I'm going to cook my family uh, a Brazilian meal. Now, 
I've never had Brazilian food, uh, but thank God for Google, right? And so I Googled what I was going to make, and I had on our menu, as we were going to watch the opening uh, ceremony, I had some croquettes and some seasoned beef and a coconut dessert, and I, I took the day off to spend making this perfect meal as we're going to watch the opening ceremonies. And it was a disaster from start to finish when everybody came home from school, it came home from uh, work, to, uh, I am stressed, I'm covered in flour, I'm covered in everything. We, we go to sit down to eat this meal and it tastes horrible. Uh, the, the croquettes, this, what's supposed to be this light, fluffy, filled dish is like as hard as a rock. And, and, and I, the whole time, this whole meal, I am stewing, I am complaining, it is awkward because nobody wants to say anything to offend me, and, and eventually uh, uh, my kids finally said, uh, admitted that this was a horrible meal, uh, which was, you know, to my ego but they could have cared less. They could have cared. All they wanted to do was watch the opening ceremony of the Olympics. And I ruined this meal because of my struggle with imperfection. As I said, I am one who pushes myself. I tend to be pretty independent. I work and have worked really hard for anything I've accomplished in life. And so being perfectly imperfect has never been easy for me. And I, I wonder if it is easy for you. And when I started in ministry, I kind of came in with this mindset of like I had to be the perfect pastor and I had to, you know, really work really hard to pastor the, 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 the most perfect church. And right when I entered ministry, there was this emphasis in kind of church guru leadership stuff of the language was returning to the early church. And it was all, the, the books I would read, the things I read in seminary, uh, the, the leadership books and podcasts and, and presentations I would go to was, was an invitation to go back. And, and, and the, the early church was kind of idealized as this perfect expression of faith. And we would read passages like Acts chapter 2, which says this, All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. I mean, this is this is beautiful, right? It's amazing that we should be like them. Look how everyone gets along and works together in love and peace and harmony. It's like a, like a weekly hold hands and sing kumbaya repeatedly. This is, when I entered ministry, I thought this is the ideal. This is what church is supposed to look like. Everybody just shows up and it's perfect and, and, and beautiful and harmonious. But if you've spent any time in the New Testament, you realize that everything falls apart after Acts chapter 2. I mean, the New Testament itself, from the Gospels to Revelation, is one letter after another addressing issues in the church, dissension and disturbances and disagreements. I mean, I love, how, I love how Paul opens his letter to the church in Galatia. Galatians chapter 1, which many scholars believe Galatians perhaps is the earliest book of the New Testament, that Galatians was probably written even before the Gospels were written. And so remember, Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes and you have this beautiful expression of faith, and then churches begin to spread and there's plants happening in all these cities. And Paul becomes this, this apostle who his job is to kind of organize the life of these churches and to instruct them. And listen to how he, he addresses perhaps one of the earliest letters. It starts out great. Paul, an apostle, sent neither by human commission nor from human authorities, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the members of God's family who are with me. And listen to this beautiful moment. 
to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Beautiful. And then see what he says in the very next line. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. I love this. It starts out like, all praise. We just say, all praise to God, Father, who who has redeemed us and set us free. And then all of a sudden, Paul changes and he goes, what the heck is wrong with you? It's like this slap on the hand. Stop it. Because something quickly in Galatia has fallen to imperfection. Or James. James takes this letter to early Christians and he identifies some major problems. They're succumbing to false teachings. There's class distinctions and partiality in the church. There's a whole lot about gossip and slander. Remember that whole portion of James where he he talks about the power of the tongue and it needs to be bridled like we bridle a horse or the tongue is so powerful it's like a rudder that steers a ship because the gossip and slander had gotten so bad. Or even he even chastises them because they have all these right beliefs He says, you have faith, but your faith is doing nothing. Remember that line in James, faith without works is what? Dead. And the list goes on and on and on in the New Testament. There's racial tensions in the New Testament. There's conflicts over circumcision, which is really awkward. There's issues of taxes and should you pay them or not pay them. There are there are brothers and sisters in Christ who are suing each other. There's fights over whether you ought to be able to eat meat that is offered to idols. Paul has to address how the church did communion because some people were treating the communion table like an all-you-can-eat buffet. There is extreme disunity among the believers. And then we have that nice broad category of sexual immorality. I mean, have you ever read 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7? One of the issues Paul has to address in 1 Corinthians is whether somebody can have intimate relations with their father's wife. The church was not perfect, it was a hot mess. Throughout history, the church has always been perfectly imperfect because it's made up of perfectly imperfect people. And I'm so glad that perfection is not the standard of our acceptance. Grace is. This fact that fundamental to our understanding of who God is and what God has done through the death and the resurrection of Jesus is that you and I are wildly accepted and embraced by God. That from the cross, God, Jesus doesn't even look down and say these people need to get their act together but even would be bold enough to turn to the prisoner on the other side of the cross who is also hanging, who has done probably nothing good in his life and says, but today you, in your imperfection, you will be with me in paradise. But, or and, We are wildly accepted and embraced by God. But when you and I choose to follow Jesus, the adventure begins. We are constantly challenged to grow and mature as disciples. Listen to how the writer of Hebrews says this. Hebrews 10, the writer says, And let us consider, let us think about how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, 
but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. I love this word provoke. Provoke in Greek is periaximus, and, get, and, and, and provoke is, is too um, gentle of a word in English. Periaximus means to irritate somebody. Read this passage again, and let us consider how to irritate one another to love and good deeds. Now, I have three older siblings and a younger sister, three older brothers and a younger sister. I am a master at irritating. I remember being in the back of my parents' station wagon. All five of us in the back crammed in there, and if you've ever done a road trip with siblings and that, you know, your leg touches the other person, and they go, Mom, Jason's touching me. You've all probably heard something like that. So I would take it even further. I don't know where one of my particular children gets this from, but I would then stick my finger as close to a sibling's face as possible without touching them. You know, have you done this? Just to irritate the snot out of them. I love this. This is what the writer of Hebrews says we do to each other. To irritate each other. To love each other and good deeds. Two people holding one another accountable to grow in their capacity to love. Prior to these verses in in, in Hebrews 10, the writer, who we're not sure who the writer of Hebrews is. Uh, Some say Paul, some say others. We're not sure, but 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 right before this in in the in the early churches of early verses of chapter 10, Paul talks about the absolute sufficiency of Christ's death and resurrection. Calls him a priest and says his sacrifice is absolutely powerful. It is secure. You can rest assured in your salvation because what Christ has done. But then in verse 10 or in verse, uh, excuse me, verse 24, then he recognizes something. That Christians, we are often inconsistent with our message. Even as our faith is assured, we're inconsistent on how we live out our faith. So the writer then says, you need each other. You need one another to irritate each other, to push each other, to provoke and encourage one another so that you can increase your capacity to love and good, do good deeds. You need one another. This process of maturing in our faith, of increasing our capacity to love and do good deeds. The the big church word we use for that is sanctification. Wesley, the founder of our tradition, said the process of sanctification, when we do it mutually together, when when we irritate each other to love and good deeds, Wesley said we are being made perfect in love. Now, didn't I just say that perfection wasn't the standard? And it's not. It's not the starting point. But according to Hebrews, according to what the New Testament often spoke about, according to our own Methodist heritage, is that together, as siblings in Christ, as we irritate each other, We challenge one another to be made perfect in love. Or Wesley's favorite phrase to use is what we do with each other and holding one another accountable is to watch over one another in love. We need each other because we are all perfectly imperfect people. We need one another to hold us accountable to the faith to challenge us to increase our capacity to love and do good. According to the, the, the gospel, according to Ted Lasso, if you've seen Ted Lasso, the, the show? If you don't know what Ted Lasso is, uh, Ted Lasso is a great show about this American football coach who's hired by a uh, fictitious uh, soccer, uh, English soccer team, uh, AF, AFC Richmond. So he, he travels from Oklahoma. He's never coached soccer at all. And uh, so he, he takes on this, this failing team and failing franchise. 
And Lasso has these, you know, like any coach has these like one-liners and, you know, he's like a walking uh, locker room poster, you know, all those like positive encouraging phrases. And there's a scene uh, where Lasso is, is holding his phone in his, in his office and Rebecca, his boss, comes in. And, and Lasso has left his family behind in Oklahoma and is go, left his son and his wife and is going through a, a pretty painful divorce. And you can tell he had just received some text message or message that has left him uh, pretty shaken up. And Rebecca comes in, who also uh, has had some, some pain and trauma in her life. And they have this great conversation. And she can tell that he's really struggling with whatever uh, was just expressed on the phone. And so she asks him, you know, how, Ted, how, how are you doing? And I love what he says. He looks at Rebecca and he says, you know, I'm a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. I don't think there's a better way of saying who I am or who you are or who we are as a church. That we are a work in progress. And notice the word work. It's a process, a continual process process. We are perfectly imperfect. I am perfectly imperfect. I'm inconsistent with my faith. I have doubts and questions and fears and reservations just as you do. And yet in our perfectly imperfectness, in our progmessness, something beautiful happens when we come together with that recognition. And to be honest, I don't, I don't want to pastor a perfect church anymore. There are a lot of churches that try to kind of uphold this perfect facade with these kind of happy, shiny people all the time. I don't, I don't want to pastor a church where we even see eye to eye on everything. I want to pastor a church that is a work in progress. A church full of perfectly imperfect people. I want to pastor a church where people come and with their brave questions and they wrestle with their doubts and fears. And that is seen as a sign of maturity. I want to pastor a church where we speak truth in love and we practice grace and forgiveness, and reconciliation. I want to pastor a church where we walk in the way of love, a love that challenges us to grow and mature as Christians. You know, over the last few weeks, we've named our values, some of them, and we're not always going to live up to those values perfectly, but we'll keep holding each other accountable to it. We're going to step on each other's toes and we're going to be invited to practice our faith of grace and forgiveness. We're going to continue to stretch and our capacity to love and to practice empathy. We're going to be challenged in our thinking. We're going to expo be exposed to each other's lived experiences that differ from our own. And we'll be invited continually to listen to each other's stories with grace. And here's the thing, it will be irritating. But if we're open to the Spirit of God within the irritation, if we accept that all of us are a work in progress, that we are perfectly imperfect, but together, we can grow and mature as disciples. We can increase our capacity to love even more than we do now, and we can be challenged to do even more good than we have already done. Friends, I'm not expecting perfection. And admitting we are perfectly imperfect really is a humility, a posture of opening ourselves up to the creativity of the Holy Spirit. 
And it's an invitation for us to not just show up on a Sunday, to go through the motions and then head back to our cars and head home, but to do life together, to challenge one another, to listen to each other and and mutually irritate one another to greater love and good deeds. Will you pray with me? God, you looked upon humanity and all of its imperfections and you sent your son to to take on all of our imperfections and to hold it with grace and forgiveness and compassion. May we do the same to one another. May we practice irritating each other to love and good deeds to challenge one another, to sit with one another and hear each other's experiences and stories. May we hold all those stories as sacred. May we be challenged together to mature and grow in our faith so that we might model for the world who you are. And so, Lord, I thank you for Scioto Ridge, a perfectly imperfect congregation filled with perfectly imperfect people, led by perfectly imperfect pastors. Would you use us in our imperfection to be light in the midst of the darkness? In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen.